Good afternoon to you. Mark Suttoth, HurricaneTrack.com here. It's Friday, the 17th day of June, 2022. Time for the hurricane outlook and discussion, and I do have some pretty good news for this weekend and the next several days. The Atlantic is nice and quiet. While the eastern Pacific remains busy, I guess the East Pack is going to get its stuff out of the way over the next couple of weeks or so, week to 10 days, we'll say. And then after that time, the Atlantic might start to come to life a little bit more. But at least the next few days, two to five days, no worries on the Atlantic side. And we can see that reflected nicely in the Tropical Weather Outlook products from the National Hurricane Center. Here's what was, I mean, I guess it still is, Invest Area 93L. Not a real big threat to develop, only 10% chance. It is going to bring some rain, though, to this region. It's been doing so and will continue to do so. And that could cause flooding issues, as you should well know by now. Looking out to the next five days as well, the former map was uh, two days. So the next five days, nice and quiet in the Atlantic Basin. In the eastern Pacific, we have Celia, a new tropical storm to the south of Guatemala and El Salvador in the extreme southeastern Pacific. Then we have uh, Hurricane Bloss, 90 miles per hour. Both of these systems not a threat to land areas directly, although Celia down here is close enough to shore that there is some peripheral activity impacting parts of Central America. We can look at that nicely here, easily on the satellite imagery. It's not much down here, but there is a little bit of shower and thunderstorm activity occasionally reaching the coast there of extreme southeast Mexico and southwest Guatemala. I bet it's real muggy down there overall anyway, pretty close to the tropics. And then there's our hurricane, Hurricane Bloss, starting to feel some negative impacts from the atmosphere and the ocean as well. And it's probably reached its peak there. Look at that. Uh, that's an MCS, a mesoscale convective system. Uh, fancy way of saying large complex of thunderstorms. Sometimes these do work their way out over the ocean and they have to be watched. You never ignore a system like that when it's hurricane season. What about 93L? Well, it's down here and not doing too much. Conditions just aren't favorable enough for it to develop and therefore it probably won't. Sliding off to the east a little bit, or a lot, I guess, all the way out to the coast of Africa here. Look at this, tropical wave coming off, and uh, it's going to switch the wind direction down here to more west and southwest, and that will help to warm this part of the Atlantic even more, slowing the trade winds. All of these are puzzle pieces that are coming together that once we get to, I mean, maybe even just a few weeks out, we don't really know when the switch will be flipped. There is some indication, our indications, plural, in the guidance there, the weeklies as we call it, from the Euro, the CFS, the GEFS, ensembles, ensembles, ensembles. You know, when you look at one, it's like asking one person their opinion on something. Well, you're going to get a strong opinion, whatever the case may be, but you get a bunch of people together and you develop a consensus about something, a favorite restaurant, a favorite movie, and if you really want to make it exciting, talk about politics. So at least generally we don't have to worry about that in the weather, but we do try to look at the big picture, not just one sort of opinion, if you will. That's a good metaphor, a good way to uh, look at it, of an operational model. And the general consensus from most of the long-range guidance is that eventually we're just going to ramp things up, especially as we get into July. But nothing for the next few days, and that's great, obviously. All right, vorticity time. Uh, there it is for Bloss, pretty well defined. There's the vorticity signature for Celia. There's the pretty rounded vorticity signature for 93L. I mean, look, it's almost a perfect little ball, but there's not much spin. There's not much energy there uh, overall, not a lot of deep convection. It just doesn't have a lot of firepower, so to speak. And so it's not on its way to developing. You look at this and you go, well, what is that? Well, look at the whole thing. It's a large area of spin in the atmosphere. The vorticity is stretched out over a large area. That's kind of a front draping down. And then it's concentrated up here in the North Atlantic where water temperatures are too cold. So this is more extra tropical in nature, a mid-latitude storm system. All right. All right. So looking at the GFS, speaking of models, this is the GFS operational. 5,000 feet in the atmosphere or about 850 millibars up. And on this one, you can clearly see, let's use blue, there's the vorticity signature, nice and round for Bloss. 
not so much in the way of, I mean, look at the difference. This is a hurricane. This is a low-end tropical storm. And this is an area of invest. I mean, come on. This is a great opportunity to learn about what I look for. This is what I look for. Bloss, easy to pick out there. Duh. You know, there it is. And then you look at Celia. It's a little bit, you know, uh, it's there, but it certainly isn't um, nearly as impressive on this particular product uh, than, uh, as Bloss is. Get my words crossed here. And then, of course, you look at 93L in the Gulf of Honduras up here, and it's barely there. So a good uh, example of, you know, formative uh, tropical storm, but weak and full-on hurricane, but not a particularly intense hurricane, and it's not very large either. Anyway, let's put this into motion, and you can see what happens. Everything kind of scoots off. By the way, you can definitely see this gyre effect up here of just the way the winds are. Everything's kind of curled up in here. Central America is kind of in the way, and that is pre uh, preventing much to develop with 93L and it's keeping a lid. I mean, there's just so much going on there, a lot of energy. But you can clearly see, look at these wind barbs come in here, these coming in here like this, just this overall spin with a little bit of a common area that these are rotating around. But once 93L kind of dissipates up here completely and a big old area of high pressure develops up over the lower 48, uh, our system here should take off to the west and west-northwest with time. This is 60 hours out. Let's see if that happens. Yep, it does. And eventually it makes its way towards cooler water. We're out at about a week, though. Let's just stop there. Uh, right there's a week. All right, so there we go. We looked at a week out. And, uh, you know, Celia tries to become a hurricane. And we'll have to watch and see what happens beyond a week's time frame, right? And then look, the GFS just doesn't want to give up. I'm going to have to bring out uh, Rick Astley again. Never going to give you up, right? It still wants to develop something out of this big gyre down here. And the problem is, in the longer term, eventually conditions are going to allow, and we could see multiple hurricanes coming out of this region for the rest of the season. It's just not happening yet. I think the GFS is showing us what's, what's possible down there, this big gyre, this hurricane factory, it's trying to crank up, but it's having issues. Maybe it's having supply chain issues too, which is a good thing because we know they're coming. We're just, you know, if we can delay it as long as possible, uh, that'll be the best case, right? Because we know what's probably going to happen, especially as we get towards the climatological ramp up later on in August. All right, uh, focusing out on the bigger picture, here is this envelope of energy coming off Africa. Um, we have. Celia, there's Bloss, we've already covered those, there's 93L. The rest of the Atlantic, the tropical Atlantic down here, generally quiet, no areas of energy. We can see that in the vorticity analysis. Back to this real quick, you see, there's just not much out here overall. And this is the analysis, a true satellite shot, showing us the vorticity, whereas this is a model forecast or an interpretation. So let's move this out to a week, watch what happens, and I do want to draw your attention Let's go out to 48 hours. This piece of energy comes off of Africa, a nice little seedling. And look how the winds turn around here as well. Northeast here, and then they switch around. And instead of just coming on across like the trades would normally do, we are getting this gradual turning where they're headed back towards from west to east. Some westerlies, low-level westerlies. That is important because that will help to push the, uh, the Atlantic here back towards Africa and it does not promote upwelling. In fact, it'll promote warming, and that's not a good thing for later on. But boy, the Azores high up here. Look at that. There's the Azores Islands. Huge subtropical ridge just sitting out here over the Atlantic, dominating everything, helping that dry air come out of Africa and out into this, uh, the, the deep tropics, preventing much from happening. But once all of this calms down, and it will, then the season will start to pick up. There's three days out four, five, right there, six, and then finally seven days out. Again, the GFS trying to do something down here. And why not? It's going to keep doing it until it gets it right, I guess. But I think it is showing us the symptom of what's to come across that area. And notice, too, a week out right there, 168 hours. Look at these wind barbs through here. Five to ten knots of trades, if that. That's not very strong. We don't have this giant Azores high just cranking the easterlies across the Atlantic, 
cooling everything off down here. We're going to have a very interesting time, and not in a good way, I think, once we get to the heart of the season. All right, I want to switch gears real quick. Uh, a couple things. These last several years, I've been able to expand my uh, topics. You know, I'm known for hurricanes. I understand that. It's hurricane track. But I'm a weather geek at heart. I'm a geographer, an earth scientist, whatever. I mean, that's what I've studied. The, the way weather and hurricanes and everything impacts our geographic landscape. Um, so that being said, I have a huge interest in other big impact weather events. Winter storms, nor'easters, lake effect, tornadoes, hailstorms, you know, even droughts, wildfires. All of that is related to the weather. But one of my favorites that I think is really interesting is the North American monsoon. And we're in monsoon season. It began June 15th. And so I just wanted to refer you here real quick. National Weather Service Phoenix. Um, it is monsoon awareness week. There are a lot of fascinating parts to this. Burn scars are a flood risk. So these are some great infographics that they have put together. Um, I've also got a huge fascination, not just with the monsoon, because that is a seasonal shift of the wind that brings the deep moisture out from the backside of a pretty strong area of high pressure or low pressure that comes in uh, from California and helps to advect some moisture up out of um, the jungle areas of Mexico. All that evapotranspiration that's going on um, across parts of the, 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 the forested areas, the jungles of Mexico and Central America, that's moisture that gets pulled in. Anyway, there's also tropical cyclones. Um, probably not the year, but you never know where we get one up into the desert southwest over northwest Mexico. But that's also a huge fascination of mine because that is like the monsoon on steroids. You can get three, four, five, six inches of rain, sometimes more. Areas like Tucson and Phoenix, even Vegas, um, and parts of south uh, southern California up into southwest Utah, Colorado, New Mexico even. This is a huge fascination of mine. So that being said, it is Monsoon Awareness Week. And uh, there's some interesting things starting to brew as we go uh, into July. I was looking at some of the stuff. Yes, it's hot out there. But the updated monsoon outlook, a bit more tilted towards a wetter than normal monsoon, especially for July. So, you know, I've got a few followers out there. Even some of our Patreon supporters live out in this region. So this is interesting. July, August, September, a wetter overall outlook, especially favoring southern Arizona, and um, this is important. July specifically, pretty active. So, you know, we're a little over halfway through June. Once we get into July, I'll be watching this closely, and I plan on heading out there for at least a week, maybe longer, we'll see. Um, Got to balance family life too, but this is a big signal. This is important and something I'll be on top of, all right? So just wanted to bring that up. And in fact, you can see it start to manifest itself just a little bit, keep your eyes on this region right through here. I'm just gonna scroll through the GFS, the uh, six hour precipitation panels, if you will, uh, or layer, whatever. Look, you can see it, it's diurnal, fires up in the late afternoon and evenings and then dies away. This is two weeks out, and you can just see the overall rhythm there. A lot of moisture starting to show up, well, a lot compared to where it's been, I want to be a part of that. I want to go out there and observe it, tell some stories, capture some things, use our technology. Um, it's hard. That's like almost like trying to find hail cores and tornadoes in the plains. You know, these slot canyons that fill up, the flash flooding, the, the haboobs, the dust devils. It's all very interesting to me. And we're getting towards the time when I'm going to head out there. So I just wanted to let you know that. All right. All right. So before I let you go, uh, I've got about a dozen of these left. And then they're gone. Um, I've got a few emails from people that showed me pictures. I thought about showing them, but I didn't ask their permission, so I didn't. They're on their wall, their classrooms. A couple of teachers ordered them. Um, it is just really cool. The big tracking map, if you want one, it's going to be a historic season probably. Even if they all stay out to sea, like 2010, you can plot all of that on the hurricane tracking poster. I'll put the link to it. It's 18 by 24 inches. It's a big old poster. You'll really like it. Don't go and order a t-shirt right now. I need to take this off. And the reason I say that, we've got a brand new store coming on July 1st. It's going to be uh, better, more products and swag or whatever. So ignore the t-shirts for now. 
Get a map, though. I want to get rid of them all and get them into your hands. So uh, thanks to everybody that's ordered one. I do appreciate it. It's a piece of artwork. It really is something that I designed. So the link to that will be in the description of today's video. Speaking of today's video, you're probably watching on YouTube, right? Or it could be Facebook. But subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification button so you know when I post something. And you'll know. That's the idea. You'll know, right? All right. Have a good weekend. I will be doing the morning updates. Uh, what's up in the tropics? Probably not a real need for a hurricane outlook and discussion until Monday. I don't want to oversaturate you with info when there's not much to talk about. So I'll do the morning um, updates. What's up in the tropics? I've got 17 in a row. The plan is 183, one way or the other. I have fun doing those. Those are really neat, nice and short and to the point. So look for those uh, tomorrow and Sunday, and then I'll be back Monday afternoon with the hurricane outlook and discussion. All right, in between, have a safe weekend. I do appreciate you tuning in. I'm Mark Sutter, Hurricane Track. I'll talk to you again over the weekend with the What's Up uh, episodes, and then we'll talk again in more detail Monday afternoon.